Okay. All right, so um, welcome again to the Designing and Planning a Tassel Graphic webinar. I am Liz Anderson. I'm the coordinator with the Florida Instructional Materials Center for the Visually Impaired. We are a statewide discretionary project with the Florida Department of Education. Um, and we provide Braille and large print textbooks to students throughout the state, professional development, um, all kinds of resources for students in our state. So if you would like to learn more about us, our website is FIMCEI.org. So be sure to check that out. And so we talked, oh, we've got captioning. All right, good, yay, thank you. <laughs> and so um, again, for the chat, just make sure you have that changed to um, all panelists and attendees so everyone can see what you are typing in that chat box. And as I said before, we do have all of the handouts for this up on our website and we are recording this. I just started that. So the recording will be up by the end of the week for you to come back and check it out if you need to. And then that will move to our past events page when we do that. And so in service credit, so if you are looking for um, credit for your Florida teacher certification or ACBREP credit, you need this opening code for when you do the process to get credit, which I will explain at the end of the webinar. But our opening code is TACTIL. So TACTIL, T-A-C-T-I-L-E. All right. And so our presenter, as I mentioned, is Lucia Hasty. She is a Rocky Mountain Braille Associate. She has a plethora of experience in our field. Um, she's a consultant, she was a TBI, she was an ex officio trustee with the American Printing House for the Blind, she's taught for universities, wrote numerous books, and been on advisory boards, all kinds of things. So we're super lucky to have her presenting for us. So with that said, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to her. Okay. Oh, did I? Okay, I'm hoping that. Oh, there we go. Okay, can you hear me, Liz? I can hear you. Yes. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Can you see the presentation now? Not yet. Oh, okay. Well, let's see what I need to do to get it done. Okay, it looks like it is coming up and yep, there it is. We can see it. Okay, all right. Greetings. Thanks all of you. I can't believe how many people are here. This is great. Thank you all for coming and for being part of this um, um, effort to do better graphics for our students. Um, I actually got into doing graphics when I was a very young teacher thinking I knew how to save the world, of course. Um, and I had several students who demanded that they had graphics. All of their friends um, and classmates had graphics and they wanted them. And that's how I got into figuring it out. There was nobody to teach you how to do that. Um, that's just what we did. So um, um, that's, that's how where I came from. So today we're going to be talking about references that are <clears throat> that um, that the, the graphics that you will see and some of the other information are, are going to come from the Real Authority of North America guidelines and standards for tactile graphics, the 2010 version. Um, and that is the Braille code, um, the official Braille code for how you produce tactile graphics. That's also in the process of being revised because when this was finished, um, UEB was not yet adopted and so it's in eBay and um, so the the examples are being switched over and that kind of thing and I think Liz you told me that there are lots of that, that you have lots of copies at FIMC in case people need to request copies and you should really have a copy handy you don't need one for everybody in the district but um, at least one in your district 
may preferably more, um, so that you can look things up. Today we're just going to be going into a um, um, sort of a, a quick overview kind of thing. Um, Liz, are you seeing the page with references on it? I am just seeing your presentation. Your you're not PowerPoint. Seeing, and you're not seeing the page that has the references listed? No. Okay. I'm not sure why that is. If you shared, oh, there we go. Okay. There All right. Go. Got it. Okay. So, um, the other project I'm going to be talking about is information from the diagram project. You probably all know about Bookshare and Bookshare's father is actually Benetech. Um, and um, one of the other grants that Benetech has is one called Diagram. Um, and the point for Diagram is to figure out how to get all the diagrams that are in textbooks um, available to students um, in a timely and reasonable kind of a way. So that project now, is now in its sixth or seventh year of funding. Um, I can't remember exactly the first one was three years. I think now we're into five years, five or six years, um, and um, is in the process of building a huge image library. And I'll talk about that a little bit more too. But those are the two things that I'll be showing you images from those um, particular publications. So the first thing we want to know, we want to ask ourselves, when you open a textbook and look at it, there's zillions and zillions and zillions of graphics in there. And the first thing you want to ask is, is this appropriate for a tactile graphic? And that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, how do you figure out if this is something you need to do in a tactile graphic, the student needs to have or not? Um, um, and so that's our biggest question for the day. Um, in your packet um, and also in the guidelines and standards is a decision tree. <coughs> um, and th this is a process for um, trying to figure out whether or not you're going to need to do a graphic and, and has some really specific questions that you can ask yourself as you go through there. And the first one is this information, a repeat of facts that are already in the text. One of the techniques that publishers use is um, to um, say, show things in several different ways for different kinds of learners. So the information that's in a, um, that's in a, a print image very well may already be in text in the book and if that's the case you don't need to do that graphic. Um, would this information be more helpful in another format? Sometimes graphics are so, so heavily visual that they are not going to make much sense once you get them into the form of a tactile graphic for a tactile reader. So it might make sense to do it in some way other than an actual tactile graphic itself. Third question is, does the graphic require the reader to use visual discrimination or visual perception? Um, a few years back, we were seeing the Escher drawings where you have to the kind of thing where you have to squint and tilt your head sideways to even figure out what it is and it could be several different things, mostly visual tricks, that kind of stuff. And if that is the case, then you don't do that as a graphic at all. So the um, fourth question is, is the actual object unavailable or too small or too large or too dangerous for the person to be able to touch? You all know that tactile learners learn best when they have an object to work with as opposed to some kind of group of symbols, which is what a tactile graphic is. It's a group of symbols we put on paper and say, this means whatever the concrete thing is that you're trying to show a tactile graphic of. Um, so if, if that object is available, the real thing, then obviously that's what you would use. If not, it might meet, need to have a tactile graphic. Um, and does the reader need this information for a map, <clears throat> a figure, the information from a map or a figure or a graph um, or whatever the print illustration is to participate in classroom activities, to do their homework, to answer questions or to develop the concept that's there. If they do need this information, then it needs to be in some way communicated, whether it's a tactile graphic or whether it's um, in another form, but it needs to be communicated. 
another question um, that's not in the decision tree is just a plain, ordinary, um, easy concept. Um, wh what is it that the student is supposed to do with his information? Are they supposed to compare pieces of data? Are they supposed to report exact detail? If they are, like in a, a graph, for instance, if they have to tell you exactly what the gross national product was in a certain year, then obviously you want to make sure they have that information. Are they supposed to estimate something? Are they supposed to look at this tactile graphic um, to develop a concept? Or is it just there to entertain sighted kids? Um, and as you all know, um, what entertains sighted kid does not, sighted kids um, usually does not entertain a tactile reader for sure. Okay, let's talk about some of the editing techniques. <clears throat> Number one, there's nothing sacred about a print image. And when I use the word image, I'm usually talking about print. Um, when, it's, when I use the word graphic, I'm usually talking about a tactile graphic, if that helps with definitions. Um, some of the things that you can legally do to that image that are there as you're in the process of transferring it from a print image to a tactile graphic is that you can eliminate part of it if you don't need it all um, or crop it. Um, uh, um, an example is if you need to show where the colonies in the United States are, um, the original um, 13 colonies, you don't necessarily have to show the entire map of North America in order to show that piece. So you can eliminate some of the parts in order to get the image big enough that you can then make it into a readable tactile graphic. You can consolidate stuff, and we're going to look at some examples of this. You can consolidate stuff. Um, if this is a map of exports or natural resources and it shows you 17 oil wells spread all over the country you don't need to show 17 of them you can just so show clusters where those oil wells are and there might be three or four not 17. Um, you can minimally distort now we're not going to tell Texas this but if you need to do a map of the United States and it doesn't fit on the page terribly well you can shorten up the length of Texas um, or for that matter you can shorten up the length of Florida um, because the map is not it, it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly to scale and actually the one that you're looking at in print very well may not be exactly to scale either um, remember that whatever you're <clears throat> looking at on paper is um, it is a group of symbols that mean something, that they indicate something, they stand for whatever it is you're trying to communicate. Um, it, it does clearly not have to be the exact thing. Sometimes, and we're not gonna get into this today, but sometimes you might need to separate the information so that you've got um, maps as a perfect example. Very often you'll find a map and it has natural resources and it has um, areas of weather, climate. Um, it has rivers and um, capitals and major cities and all kinds of information on it. And that may just be absolutely too much information to put on one graphic. So you may have to separate it into several other ones. And as I said, we're not gonna get to that today. That's a lot more detail than we can go over. Um, in, the, in this basic um, time that we have. It could be that you might describe some or all of the graphic in a, in a transcriber's note, as opposed to trying to get it all into that graphic. One of the things we very often have to do with maps, um, with, um, with tactile graphics, is to change the view. Um, and so that you un-3D it, in other words. Um, think how many bar graph, I mean pie graphs you've seen that um, have an actual edge. They look like a little stack of quarters. And so you're seeing that outside side edge as well as all of the pie pieces that are on the top. <clears throat> that's, that's confusing information to a tactile reader. And so we will change that view so it's not 3D. So that the view is either a frontal view or an aerial view or a side view is one view at a time. Sometimes you may need to do two 
Emmett two graphics um, to take care of that image because they need to be able to see more than one side. <clears throat> Whatever you do when you um, are editing a graphic, it needs to, you need to be able to provide context. In other words, if you um, are talking about where um, a hurricane is coming into the United States, you can't just show a map that has Texas and Louisiana on it because a tactile reader may not know where that is in relation to the whole rest of the country. They may not know, may not know how close that is to the Gulf Coast of Florida either in the process. So you need to always provide context for anything that you're showing in a graphic. That information may not be part of the repertoire of information that your tactile reader um, has in their head. And you need to always provide a frame of reference. Um, and when we talk about when we talk about more detailed um, complex tactile graphics, we will talk more about that frame of reference. But um, for instance, the, that's sort of the same as provide the context for it. Um, um, are, so far, are there any questions about any of those um, particular techniques that you can use when you edit something for production as a tactile graphic? There okay. haven't been any, yeah, there's no questions in the chat. No raised okay. hands, yeah. All right, all right. So let's look at some examples of that. When we look at simplifying the graphic, this is the print image that um, is in a textbook. And if you'll notice, we're looking at two sides and the top of this chunk of skin that somebody has carved out of a human being, heaven forbid. And um, there's lots and lots of detail there that might be pretty confusing to um, a tactile reader. And if you'll notice in the transcriber's kit note in the bottom, um, it says in the figure, there are many parts of the skin that are shown. Only the parts that are labeled in print are shown below. And here's your tactile image. Now, if you realize this looks very, very different than this print image, but the whole point is that the purpose of this graphic is for the reader to know what all the all the parts of the skin are to know that there are sweat glands and that there are blood vessels and pores and hairs etc this has been redrawn so that it's a much much simpler um graphic this is from the banna guidelines by the way um, this is in the examples um, that are included in the banner guidelines. Eliminate or consolidate. It's perfectly legitimate um, and cartographers, people who do this for a living, call this generalization. <clears throat> it's perfectly legitimate to not show every single island. If you look at this map of Alaska, um, from the, the Aleutian Islands, there's just tons and tons of little teeny tiny islands out there. Some of them have actual cities in them, on them, and some of them are just islands and they're not, they don't even have names on them that are there. So unless you're studying the Hawaiian islands and every single one of them um, has a name and has specific information about them, you could consolidate those. So you don't need to show absolutely all of those um, little islands that are out there. Another way of consolidating is, um, and this has to do with the rule of fives. Let me tell you what this is. <clears throat> um, what we know about how kids read tactile graphics is that they can manage up to five different areas, different lines, different points, symbols, and if you have more than that, and this one has 12, I think it is, um, then it becomes so overwhelming with, uh, um, with all of that many different pieces of information um, that it's very, very difficult to sort out um, for tactile readers. So you don't wanna have any more than five different areas. In this particular one, there are no, actually no, lines, like there's no rivers, there's no country boundaries, um, there are no lines that are involved in this, but there are all these different rainfall areas. <clears throat> and so you can see how they've been consolidated um, from those 12 into five so that they're easier to manage. 
Oh, I don't know where the print and where the graphic image for that is. My apologies. I think you have it in your folder. But um, these were collapsed so that they didn't, um, for instance, the bottom one is zero to 50. The next one is 50 to 100. Those were collapsed so that you have zero to 100. Because this is the, con what's being presented here is a general concept of what the um, rainfall areas look like, where the dry areas are and where the really wet areas are. Um, it does not, and it's not that they need to report that there are 26 average millimeters a year of rain. They just need to understand generally that the wet areas um, are on the coast and the dry areas are in the middle. That's, that's the purpose for this particular one. So consolidating can make a piece of very confusing information turn into a piece of um, um, useful and understandable information for a tactile reader. Okay. So should this one be a tactile graphic? Here's the text that goes with it. It's talking about Machu Picchu and um, the altitude when it was built, that it was a city and what they think about all of that, um, the history of Machu Picchu. And then here's the image that you get. And notice it has a figure, at the, a figure number and a caption at the bottom and says located in today's Peru at an altitude of 8,000 feet, which basically, basically summarizes what that paragraph you just looked at said. And so the question is, should this be a tactile graphic? Um, do we have any comments about that? You guys can type in the chat box. Oh, Andrea is saying no. Or so, oh, I think we have a raised hand. Maybe. Hi, Sharla. Yes. Okay. So I will give Sharla the microphone. She's uh, muted. Yeah. Put that on mute. Okay, unmuted. Oh, there we go. Now she's unmuted. Okay. No, because it's um, too much detail and it's um, an aerial view and um, it would be too much detail to really interpret tactily. It, that's exactly right. This should not be a tactile graphic. If if for some reason it needs additional description to what is actually in that paragraph beforehand, it looks pretty complete to me. But if it needed additional description, then you could do that in a transcriber's note to try and um, take a photograph. Um, a lot of times an aerial photograph or an aerial view of something is a good way to show it depending on what you're showing but to try and take this and turn it into something that looks like a tactile graphic it is um, just basically creating confusion and frustration for your student actually so thank you charla for applying all of the uh, things we just talked about for when you do it we do okay, have so, a comment in the chat um Pamara, would you reiterate what the text that goes with Figure 1.9 was so the student knows what the description was. The slide before. Yeah. Can you see that text? Yeah. Am I at? Am yeah, I, I can see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so that was the text that was that um, went along with this image and it and um, as you can see in the text there, it says figure 1.9. It's actually linked to it so that you could click to go to that image if you wanted to. Um, so are there any other questions about that? Doesn't look like it, no. Okay, good. All right. So now, if it's just, I'm going to take a little sidetrack here. If a description works best, then um, there are some wonderful guidelines for descriptions. Um, 
on that page that had the references on it way back at the beginning. Um, it talked about the diagram project and NCAM. NCAM is um, National Center for Accessible Materials, Accessible Media. And it's from um, a PBS station, um, WGBH in Boston. And they have just absolutely done wonderful, wonderful um, things um, around accessible media and all kinds of different media. But one of the things they initially did was they wrote some image description guidelines and um, they, um, and then they partnered with Diagram when the first grant was, um, was awarded from the Department of Education. And so those were further developed. Um, the, uh, those were further developed and now are on the Diagram website. Um, they're a wonderful tool to get used to sort of learning how to do description, really good descriptions and have them be as succinct as possible. <clears throat> so when you have time, you might want to switch over and look at those and on the, at the end of the presentation, there are um, links to slide uh, links. There is a slide with links on it that will um, that will take you to there. Poet is another piece of software that was developed by the Diagram Project that sort of walks you through doing a description. You give it a, cer a certain amount of information and it basically generates a description for you. But now that I've taken that little sidetrack. So if you're going to do a description, in addition to a tactile graphic or instead of a tactile graphic, <clears throat> what you want to do is um, make sure that you identify what it is you're looking at, a photo or a drawing or a chart or painting or whatever it is, instead of just saying picture of, um, or it, the guidelines used to say picture colon. Uh, now you'd say photo colon um, um, and then say what photo is of or a drawing or um, a painting or whatever. Um, you want to all give a general overview of what the image is. In other words, just say what it is you're looking at. Um, you know, with Machu Picchu, it would be an ancient city. And then you give specific details about that, but only if they're needed for the content. Very often people will look at um, a print image and think they need to describe absolutely everything in the image and tell what color everything is and <clears throat> how some things are bigger, some things are smaller. If the content that um, is around there needs those details, then describe it. If you don't need all those details, then um, it doesn't matter what color shirt one of the boys has on. That's if that's not what's important in the thing. Because basically what you do is you burden that tactile reader with both more information than he needs and more time that it takes to get through that illustration. And that's one of the things we need to think about is how much time it takes for kids to sort through tactile graphics. Um, I've seen kids who are taking standardized tests <clears throat> say I ought to skip this option because they know that it's timed. They know that they um, are going to have to sort out all the details and figure out what the tactographic means. And they'll skip over that one, especially after they've had conversations with, with teach after the teacher tells the class about um, statistically what happens when you skip an item or when you guess for guess the answer to an item or when you really work hard at answering it correctly. I've ac actually seen students, students say I'm skipping over this one as a graphic with it. I'm not doing it. Um, so we don't want to burden kids with too much information either in a description or actually in a, in a tactile graphic either. Be sure that you read the text around the image so that you know how it, how this image relates to the text. I mean, why is it there? What is it that the student needs to get out of that image? <clears throat> okay, this is an example of change the view. I've never seen one that, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm just having a little crazy throat morning. Um, and it is morning for me here in Colorado. Um, this is a really old image, but it probably is probably one of the worst print images I've ever seen when it comes to trying to make sense out of this. This is a picture of the sun, believe it or not. And it has this wedge cut out of it, um, a very peculiar kind of a slice 
chunk, whatever it is. Um, and then it has all of the all of the components that are in the sun and it you have a whole list of I'm sorry I don't have the whole worksheet um, you have a whole list of things that you need to find and you see that those are numbered um, and the point is that um, that if you were doing this for as a diagram and you were saying that that little um, avocado seed right in the middle of this thing is the core of the sun then you would then you would be labeling this is an opposite activity in that they've numbered it and by out to the side you had to come up with what that word was you had to choose it from a word list at the top of the page but what we've got is a crazy view why is this thing not just cut in half why are we not looking at um, a slice slice right down the middle as opposed to the chunk that's sticking out and if you needed to, in order to show the solar flares and the sunspots and that kind of stuff, if you needed to do two images and have one of them be the inside of the diagram, so that it was like sliced right in half, and one be the outside, you could do that if you needed to. But to have this um, crazy chunk missing out of the middle, um, as a visual learner, you understand that those three lines that come together mean that that's a corner. Tactile readers, that doesn't make any sense to them because number one, they don't come together. They stop because there's this rounded thing. This does not make any sense at all if you did this exactly like it is in a tactile form. It makes absolutely no sense to a tactile reader. So think about the view and how you might need to change it to better convey that information. Okay, so we're now back we're now back to this image of the rainfall in Australia. We talked about how you, how you might consolidate all of that information. Well, before we go to this, let me ask if there are any questions along the way yet. I don't see any in the chat. Okay, good. I, I hope everybody's still awake. That <laughs> that no, this is great. I, this is this is very good information. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, I've used this example again. And this also, I think I mentioned this before, this is in the guidelines and standards for tactile graphics. A planning sheet is something that's really helpful when you when you first get started. <clears throat> until you can do this easily in your head. If you look at each of the components that are going to be in a tactile graphic, and there is a blank planning sheet, by the way, in your folder on the website. Um, um, each of the components that are in a tactile graphic fall into one of these areas. Um, areas are specific places, specific pieces of real estate, as it were. Lines do several things. Number one, they can be boundary lines. Number two, they can be um, Oregon Trail. They can be a railroad. They can be lines you follow. Um, or they can be, if they're teeny tiny and very quiet tactily, they can be lead lines that go from the thing to the label that belongs to it. Point symbols are specific places. And then labels that you're going to use either on the graphic or in the key to the graphic um, is, is the other area that are there. This is one form of a, of a uh, planning sheet. There is another uh, planning sheet also in the, um, in the guidelines and standards that basically help you start organizing your thoughts. And if you're new to doing tactile graphics or if you just want to sort of regroup, back up and regroup, um, try using a planning sheet for your own information, no, not necessarily for any other reason, but for your own information to help you organize that information. So in this particular one, um, this one was done with a <clears throat> for microcapsule paper, and it was done with a um, um, it was done with fill patterns because it was done on the computer. That's what I'm trying to say. So you can see how that zero to fifty and fifty to two hundred, how those um, those separate areas that are in the legend, how those were collapsed so that they um, were. So we did not have 12, but only have five. And so on the on the right hand side, the texture or material 
says what you've used <clears throat> to represent that particular, what fill, what texture you've used to represent that particular um, a measurement of rain. <clears throat> there are no specific lines that you need to identify, like there are no rivers, there's no Oregon Trail, there's none of those kind of things. <clears throat> and you don't have to identify um, um, lead lines. That's something that kids should know and they'll see them over and over again. Uh, and there are no point symbols on this particular one either. But there are labels, and I want to talk a minute about labels. Um, with labels, if uh, there's a hierarchy, if you can put the label right where it goes, right, if you can put the label for the Indian Ocean right in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and maybe several places in the Indian Ocean, um, as, as you move around the map, for instance, um, then that's where you would put, that's the first choice of where to put it. <clears throat> the next choice is, is to put it near there and use a lead line to go to it. So there are times when um, you will have a map of something or other and you have a teeny tiny country and you might put the name of that country out to the side with a tiny little lead line that goes to the country. The same thing with science diagrams. You might have a gland, for instance, which is certainly not nearly as big as an organ um, or any muscle group or anything like that. And you so you would put that label near there with a lead line to it. And the third choice is to put it in the key <clears throat> and to use, um, to use a labeling system. We recommend two cells and they should be intuitive. So instead of saying number one, number two, number three, um, it, when you're naming items, you would put, for instance, um, if it was a pituitary, your pituitary gland, for instance, you might put PI. And then in the key, you would put PI space pituitary gland <clears throat> and spell it out. So um, if, so you don't worry about capitals either, by the way, when you have keyed labels, um, the capitals are not important on the actual map itself or the actual diagram or illustration, whatever it is, um, but they are important when you, when you get ready to put it in the key. So uh, for Coral C, for instance, you might use CO and then hopefully you could put the label right in the C, but if there weren't room, um, but then in the, in the key that goes with that map, you would have CO space and then you would write Coral C using the capitals as they're supposed to be used. Um, it's, so that's pretty much what I want to tell you about what key the, keys are. Let's look at a couple of keys. Hey, Lucia, I have a quick question okay. for you. So the, the form that you were just showing in the presentation is different from the handout that, um, that you gave it. It's just, the, it doesn't have, um, and the one you gave us, it doesn't have the space to put what you're using to represent each thing that you're putting in your capsule. Yeah, it doesn't look exactly like that. So I don't know if you can share that with us so we can give it to ah. the parts. But that's just something to keep in mind for after if we can okay, great. get I'm, that one from you. Yeah, you know, I'm wondering whether or not, okay, if you look in your banner guidelines, that image, We did some revision there. Oh, so is this planning sheet from the BANA? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This one, this one is one that I used for years before the BANA guidelines ever came into being. And um, this is pretty much what it looked like. And um, except the one I used, uh, all of this information at the top about the title, the graphic, the production method, and all that kind of stuff was at the bottom for gotcha. some reason, and we did a little revision. And then there was one that they used in Canada. The guidelines were written with um, by a team of um, folks from the US, uh, half us from US and the other half were from Canada. And all of us are people who produce tactile graphics. And, um, and so the other one that's in the book, um, which first goes through the simplification, resizing, consolidation, distortion, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, um, 
so that one also is in the book. So both of them are in the guidelines and standards. I apologize. I didn't realize. I'd okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, well. in there. <laughs> and so while I'm, while I'm here, let me talk about the stuff that is at the top. Um, one of the, one of the reasons the way we use this when I was a TBI um, was that we, we kept track of the graphics that we produced in house um and at that point the production method was generally collage and thermoform we didn't have all this fancy technology this was you know back in the days of covered wagons a long time ago um but we what we wanted to track what we had done we wanted to track the textures or the material or um then as this evolved further the fill that we used for a particular thing so that as we did other graphics from that book we would uh, instead of having to rethink the whole thing we would be able to be consistent and use the same fill so whatever it was we used for water on the map in chapter one we would use that same uh, fill or that same texture for water in um, chapter 10 so that there were there was consistently for the students consistency for the student and the student didn't have to re figure out what we were doing each time they came across a film. So that's why we tracked what materials we were using and we kept these and we kept them attached to the master because at that point we kept the master and kids got a thermoform copy that's a of great it. great idea, yeah. Yeah, and of course, if you have, now if you're hanging on to that computer file because you may have a very similar graphic next year for another student with a few little different differences, you're gonna keep that in a computer file because you're gonna turn around and um, use that same image that you have in the computer file, maybe put different labels on it or whatever and produce it for next year's student who's taking biology. So, and the other reason is the, one of the things we did was we tracked production time. <clears throat> Very often you'd walk into a school and um, on my caseload, um, when I was in Jefferson County schools, um, I had three kids that were seniors all taking advanced placement everything classes. They were unbelievable. I had two junior high kids who were pretty smart I had three junior high kids <clears throat> all at three different schools as well um, but you'd walk in a teacher would hand you um, a stack of a dozen diagrams that she needed for next week for biology well for one kid <laughs> um, well you multiply that amount of time it was going to take to do those graphics um, and um, figure out how much time it was going to do for each one and go from there. Trying to explain to that teacher how there's no, it was Friday afternoon, and there's absolutely no way you could have those all done for her by Monday morning was really sort of rough. So once we started tracking the time that it took to produce a graphic, you were then able to say, okay, I've got nine graphics in front of you, and th that's going to take me 10 and a half hours or whatever you could sort of estimate what it was going to take. So I can deal, I can have these ready for you by next Wednesday. So it was really helpful for us. I mean, these are regular classroom teachers that had not dealt with a blind kid before. This was their first time teaching a blind kid in, in their regular classroom. And they were, um, they, I, they thought we had some, <coughs> my apologies for my throat this morning, guys. They thought we had some magic machine that just spit out graphics or we had a truckload of graphics somewhere we could just dig through and get the right one. So this gave us some way to estimate how long it was gonna take us before we could get to that particular graphic. And by the way, there were three TBIs in that program. We all had similar caseloads. And on top of these bright, bright older kids in advanced placement classes, we all had a bunch of them. We had a bunch of little kids and beginning braille readers too. So we had crazy caseloads back in the day. And that was before our Colorado Instructional Materials Center was developed and created. It was before yours was too, by the way. So. Okay, so does that answer the questions about that? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so this is an example of a key. This is the key to that map of the rainfall in Australia um, that we looked at before. 
that we consolidated, remember, from 12 different groups down to five. And so if you'll notice at the top, it has that same transcriber's note that we saw in print that says that the 12 um, ranges of rainfall have been consolidated down to five. Um, and then um, it says key, colon, and then you have a little patch that is one inch wide and half an inch tall of the texture that was used to indicate um, over 1200 millimeters. And, and it, then you have over 600, 600 to 1200 and then whatever to 600, 200 to 600. So you have the texture there. And so when the student looks at the texture, um, on the actual map itself, they can then go to the key and say, okay, this is what this textured area means. So basically what you've replaced, the color coding that was used for the different ranges of rainfall with a texture. And that's what the key does. And a key has a specific order. First you list the areas, then you list lines, then you list point symbols. And you saw that on the, um, on the this the the tax graphic planning sheet in that order that's the order they come in and in the guidelines and standards they'll give you more information about the keys keys generally come before um, the graphic so that the student can look can go back and forth between the key and the graphic they're on facing pages generally there are some exceptions to that and the guidelines will explain that that's when you get into really complex kind of graphics um, so the student can go ba back and forth with the whole thing open and flat. You cannot read tactically with um, a page over one hand, like you're reading a page and then the page before it is on top of that and you're supposed to be reading that with the other hand. That's n that doesn't work um, and so we don't want to do that at all. And so here's another example of keys areas, um, two areas and then line and then the point symbols in this particular case are keyed symbols. So you have GL for Great Lakes and you have GM for the Gulf of Mexico and this particular one. So if you look there in the key on the left, this one happens to have uh, the Mississippi River down the middle of the, um, of the United States. So, okay. Remember, we talked about providing context. If you'll notice in this graphic, there is an outline shape of a body around this digestive system. Sometimes you'll see a print image and there's just a digestive system hanging out there, just parked on the page, on the print page. Well, it doesn't help um, a tactile reader to put that in context if, it, if you can't tell where that is. So if just the outline of that body around the digestive system is a really helpful kind of a thing. This is another time also with this image when you would do some keying in that you would, um, for instance, uh, the line, um, the, the second line that goes, uh, that shows the esophagus on the left, on the the content is on the left side of the page. So you might have there, you might have a label that says esophagus, and then in your key, all the rest of that information would be in the key. So it would say esophagus, and then it would have the little, the little short paragraph about food passes from your mouth into the esophagus, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that would be in the key as opposed to on the page. If you look at all that content, you could probably not get that much text and the tactile graphic all on one page and have it fit. Um, planning, um, that's why planning helps to figure out how much room that's gonna take up for you. Okay, this is an image from OpenStax. OpenStax is a project of Rice University in Texas and basically they have open content textbooks every place and um, they now are doing high school level stuff and every um, all of it is not it's um, creative commons copyright so you, anybody can use it wherever um, and so this is a diagram a cross-section of the brain 
okay? So if you had to do a graphic and you needed to change it around or look at something different, or you just knew that you needed a graphic of the brain and the one that you had in the textbook was really confusing, you could look for that in OpenStax and see what would happen. Now here is a Braille version of that. This Braille version came from the um, image share, which is the um, library of um, Braille images that actually it has um, 2D Braille as in tactile graphics, 3D, um, the um, patterns to build a 3D um, printed um, image. So if you want to build a 3D brain, you could do that. Um, and descriptions, and they're putting that all together, um, diagram is putting that all together into um, a huge database, uh, either the actual image itself or a link to another place where that image is. Um, so they're working with a number of different agencies and a number of different libraries. They're expecting for it to be launched in August of this year. And when that happens, I will put it on my website right away. Um, and I can also send the link to Liz and she can put it on your website so you'll know where it is. You can go in and look for graphics. But this is a very similar image of a cross section of a brain. Um, one of the things it doesn't say on there and, um, is it doesn't say that it's a cross section. And that's in it, that view that you're showing is really important for tactile readers to know about. So um, it, I, I, did you think that you would be able to use this image, um, this, gra this, this to make a tactile graphic or this tactile graphic, you could send this off to a capsule machine, you could send this off to a tiger embosser, you could convert your file format and send it off to a Phoenix embosser or a new Romeo or new Juliet and index. You could send it off to a lot of different things in this format. So if this is your image and try and compare the two, you have these in your file too. I hope you printed those out and see whether or not you think you could use this image for that. Um, I mean, this, this graphic master for that print image. Any comments about that? We didn't have any on that specifically, but we did have um, a question going back to the key. If you um, think that you, you think you would need to know the specific questions that will be asked regarding the graphic before deciding how to collapse the key. I'm not sure what you just said. So I think so. this was from Jill and back when you were looking at the keys and you were talking about collapsing them and she was saying that she thinks you would need to know what questions oh, right, are right. about it, the graphic okay. to decide uh, that. Right. And I'll back up and I'll speak to that. You're exactly right about that. Um, if you compare this image to the print one, what you'll notice is the amygdala is not on this particular graphic. However, it wouldn't be that hard to add that where it needs to be. Um, and to take this particular um, drawing and produce your tactile graphic by adding whatever it is that you needed to do. Um, it says brain sample and it should say cross section of the brain. Um, so Image libraries can make all the difference in the amount of time that it takes you to do stuff, the amount of artistic ability. The other thing is that um, you'll notice that this particular brain does not show the, all these sausage links, the you know all this wavy, curvy, brain matter uh, stuff looking like big piles of spaghetti. Um, and those are a lot of lines that are going to just add a, a little bit of craziness to the um, to the whole picture. And so you don't need to put those in the tactile graphic necessarily. They don't, you know, that texture does not necessarily need to be there. If you think that it's important that the that the reader knows that that's what those are, then put it in a transcriber's note to go along with it. Um, and you can put a transcriber's note. Um, 
anywhere in the beginning of the key at the end of the text you can put it wherever you need as close to the graphic as you can get it in the sequence of things that it that are there uh, but if you think they need to know additional information put it in the transcriber's note don't give them more tactile challenges than they um, already have okay let me back up to this it was where we collapse these yeah you're, ab you're absolutely right about the context um again you always have to read the text before and after you have to read the questions at the end of the chapter you have to try and anticipate what's what it is the teacher is going to do um is going to expect for the student from any graphic that you produce and again you want to go back to that additional question what is it that the kid is supposed to do with this graphic. What are they supposed to get out of this? You have to be sure you've asked yourself that question when you start planning and understanding what the, the content around it is, um, is going to be the only way that you can get that particular information. Okay. Um, we're getting close to doing the end. This particular graphic, um, is in the um, guidelines for descriptions. Um, do you think this would be an easily describable graphic along the way? I think it would be really hard to do if you did not have some help in doing that. And so the link at the top of the page takes you to the example and how that was described. And I would encourage you to take the time to go and look at those kinds of things. Um, you could do an entire map of the United States and um, showing which, um, which country had which claims or wherever. I never thought of Louisiana being in Nebraska. That was not ever any information that I had um, in my learning and that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this particular image, and you have to work at it to understand that there's a red line that um, starts up by Montreal and goes across, and that's um, the route that the explorer La Salle took in 1679. There's another line, um, um, that is green that actually also is the Mississippi River. So that's really confusing. That's really pretty much overwhelming when you look at this as a, as a print graphic. But so if you look at this green line, that's the Mississippi River, that's also the route that um, LaSalle took in <clears throat> 1682. But this is a pretty tricky one to describe. I would encourage you to go to the guidelines and um, to look at how these kinds of things are described so that you can look at that. Um, I, I can tell you that in my experience of lots of years of working with kids, the task of decoding tactile graphics is a pretty high level task. And um, we don't really train kids how to read tactile graphics. We don't have any really thorough, um, full range of materials out that um, give us tools to teach that particular thing with. For the most part, we don't understand how kids um, comprehend tactile graphics. Um, so we don't, we don't really teach them how to do that. So for kids, so when we give our students things that are really, really complicated and expect them to be able to sort them out, we've done a terrible disservice. We've frustrated them to no end at all. Um, and we want to be able to give them as clean graphic as we possibly can with as many ways to access the information as possible um, along the way. So, um, this particular slide is about the um, repositories that are out there. Um, APH has a great tactile image library and it's growing every day. They're getting more and more things. I sent them a note the other day and said, you guys are adding some nice stuff to your library. The, uh, the file format they're in um, is a PDF. So when you download that, you have to register. If you're not registered, you should do that. Um, you have to register, but it's no big deal. You just say what it is and they send you a little password thing. Um, you, you just put your name in there. Um, 
the, the file format that you get is a PDF. You then are going to need to be able to convert that to whatever production method you're going to be using. And we're not going to really get into that today at all, obviously. Um, but that um, that's a really, really good resource. And my understanding is the diagram is expecting to link with um, the images that are already in the APH lib uh, tachographic image library is what um, it's called. And then of course the diagram center and the image share that's happening. Uh, View Plus um, has some, a number of graphics on their website that you can download and run on your Tiger Embosser, whatever model of Embosser it is that you have. You can also use those same um, images for um, other kinds of production methods if you need to. Um, the files are all PRN files, which is what Tigers use. And um, you can use them with the enabling embossers, for instance, the newer enabling embossers, um, the Phoenix and the new uh, Romeo, the new Juliet, um, because they've written a bridge to be able to import a PRN file. Um, you can use them with capsule paper. So if you have a PF or um, an old um, tactile image enhancer, or um, American Thermoform Swell 4 machine, you can use them for that. The View Plus graphics are in um, uncontracted Braille for the most part. But if you um, have Tiger Designer, if you have an, a Tiger Embosser and you want them contracted, you can go in and change it to contracted Braille, but they're for the most part uncontracted Braille. Um, not true of the other libraries, they're contracted. Um, the Royal National Institute for the Blind in the UK, um, in conjunction with Zychem, which is the company that actually builds the swell form machines that American Thermoform sells, <clears throat> and the, they produce the swell touch paper as well. Um, they have um, what's called tactile library, and they have a good number of things. Um, Harpo is the company that makes the PIAF now. That's not who originally made it, but they bought the company and they're in Poland and that there are some images on their website. Um, I need to caution you that a number of the images they have actually came from um, an image library that was at Purdue, um, Purdue University. Um, when they had a big project that produced tactile graphics and they were all produced for swell paper. Um, a number of them came from there. They do not necessarily meet current criteria, um, the, the guidelines and standards for tactile graphics. So they're a little off, but for needing a quick image, um, if it doesn't meet um, the, the current code, Braille code for tactile graphics, then and that's not too terrible. I mean, there it is. You, so um, that helped you um, get going along the way. So um, I just want to say thank you to all of you for what you do. Um, what you do is so, so important. And it's um, very fulfilling for me to sit on an advisory board and be sitting next to one of my former students who's turned out wonderfully well and is a very competent, um, self-sufficient adult and is smarter than I am even. And it's so neat to know that the time and energy that I invested in kids um, has given them some quality in their lives. And so I just have to say thank you for doing what you do and um, for keeping committed to uh, making a difference in kids' lives and to say thank you for participating today as well. Now, um, I um, want you to know that, number one, I have a website which is um, being redone by my web guys. Um, as late as midnight last night, we were on the phone discussing things. They're making sure that everything is completely accessible. Uh, so it's sort of under construction. So you may find some crazy stuff and you may find something that looks different this week than it did last week. But it's basically a how to and it, and it talks about um, how to actually produce graphics. Um, in a number of different production methods, gives you information about new things that are out there. So um, you're welcome to visit that. You also are welcome to email me. Um, I have people that I've done trainings for 
uh, one group that I did training for uh, probably 10 years ago, they still email me and they'll, they'll um, attach an image, a print image and say, I have no idea what to do with this graphic. How do I do this? 10 years later, they're still <laughs> sending me these images. So if you have questions, um, need some support, need um, some stuff answered, don't hesitate to email me and um, I'll be glad to help you get going. I think graphics are real important and I want you to do the best job you possibly can for your students. So whatever I can do to support that, that's where I am with that. So thank you all for participating. Hope to see you again. Thank you so much, Lucia. That was a fantastic presentation. And I, I really hope that the people who attended share the recording with people that they work with and have them watch it as well. Because I think the more people we have watched this, the more it'll benefit our students. Um, so thank you. And so you all may or may not be aware that Lucia is presenting for us again next week on Thursday. So um, be sure to check that out. And we do have, I'm going to put the link in the chat box. Um, if you have questions or things that you want to share with Lucia beforehand, she can um, take a look at that before we do that session. So let me take over the share. Okay. And so, so thank you all for joining us. And because we are a Florida Department of Education project, we have four questions that we have to ask after all of our um, uh, professional development. So if you could use this QR code or go to our events page on our website or this bit.ly link and fill out that short course question survey for this session. And what we are doing for this webinar series is we're um, picking three random people who completed that evaluation, and we're gonna contact you and let you get some freebies from us. So that's a little extra, you know, um, motivation for you to fill out that evaluation form for us because we do have to collect that information. So be sure to do that. And so now, what I'm sure some of you are waiting for is our in-service credit. So the closing code for today's session, if you need that, is diagram. Diagram, D-I-A-G-R-A-M. And so in order to get that credit, what you're gonna do is you can use this QR code. The um, link is on our events page or that bit.ly link, F-I-M-T hyphen in-service. And when you fill that out, an email will be sent back to you with a certificate saying that you have earned the points for this webinar. However, if you want up to an additional two points, there will be a quiz added to our FIMC Canvas site. If you are not on our Canvas site yet and you are in Florida serving students in Florida, email me at eanderson at fimcvi.org to be added to our Canvas site so you can access those kinds of resources because there are lots of other things on that site as well. Um, and I think that, oh yes, and so we do have a session tomorrow. Um, if you attended yesterday's Girl Blaster session with William Freeman, we're doing a math one tomorrow, but that one is at one. They said it, all these other sessions are at noon, but tomorrow is at one, so make sure you um, Put that on your calendar and then next Wednesday we have UEB math and format with Kylie DeJute from APH and then like I said Lucia is presenting on Thursday at noon and to register for any of those and get the handouts go to our event page there at fimcbi.org forward slash event and um, that's all of our contact information and Lucia I just remembered so your um, presentation had a couple of different slides in there than what you had shared with us. So can we get the presentation that you shared with us today to put in our handout folder? Yeah, um, I'm, I am not muted. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I did add a few um, once I went through and realized that it's sort of missing some things. Yeah, I can read you that and send it. Um, okay, perfect, so thank there. you. Okay. Yeah, we'll update that. All right. All right. And um, Charlotte, my email is eanderson at fimcbi.org. I'll type that in the chat box as well. 
Okay. All right. Well, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us today on your lunch break or wherever you are right now. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and that you can join us tomorrow at one o'clock for um, math and Braille Blaster. Well, that should be a very beneficial session. So thank you again for joining us.